where she said, you know, the other day, somebody asked me, how are you? And she's like, I said, fabulous. And she said, I actually really felt that. Because before it's like a forced, let's try to feel good, you should feel happy. And that's like a fight as well because it's not something you're authentically feeling. And so then you feel like a fake, right? All these things are, it's not just the one thing, it's all the ways that it impacts you as a human being in your life. And the best thing that she said is that it actually felt normal. And I think that's with anyone with a struggle in depression, anxiety, it's like, I just wanna be normal, right? Even though none of us are normal, right? We do though have this idea of- Have this picture of what normal, what normal is. Yes. And we're not it, right? right? But everybody else, is Magic. right magically but what that meant to her is that it was it came up in her own system as truth not something she was trying to force because obviously it's more acceptable to be joyful than to be sad right per se in and on our daily basis of life and the beauty in that is that's really the power we do have if we're working at that subconscious mind level between the system, we can really change how they communicate and how they see our life versus just thinking we have to fight this internal resistance with our system every day of our life, right? And that's the key with bioemotional healing is we're not, it's not about fighting your mind or your struggle. It's about partnering with your mind and your internal See, system. See, that's the dancer in you. Yes, there we go. So I've identified probably eight or 10 operating beliefs or operating principles in what you're saying. I think I've probably heard about 15. One is, it, it, you said it better, but the, our brains are not optimized for happiness, they're optimized for survival. Mm -hmm. um, the the pact around these emotions are beliefs and we can look at the beliefs that are driving the emotions so this may be a bigger question than than you can sit on the spot and answer but if you were to identify what are the 5 10 15 operating principles of the way you work with people the beliefs that you have when you go in in, in NLP, we used to have the 27 presuppositions of neurolinguistic programming. Mm -hmm. And I can never remember except one at a time, you know, in a specific situation. So I realize it's a difficult question. Bye, give yeah. me your 27 uh, presuppositions. <laughs> yeah. But if, if, the, if your go to is like, I, I, one of them, and you didn't say it, you said it better than this as well, is, is that people are operating from, I am not enough. Mm -hmm. You said unworthy, usually when they're suffering. So some of these mm -hmm. things that you've learned from your clients and some of the operating principles or beliefs that you have that help them. Yeah. One thing that is, is so foundational is understanding how impactful our childhood was. And, and it's not to anybody's fault because when we're children, we don't have the conscious awareness or, or wisdom or even rationality to make sense of our experiences. Right. We just internalize them, right? And we come up with beliefs based upon what's going on in our, in our life and in our, our household. And one of the most important principles is really teaching my clients going back to all the, all the way back then is whatever pops into your head doesn't mean it's true. And that's something I think none of us were really just sat down and, and taught. Like if you have something come in like I'm not lovable or I'm stupid or I'm not talented, nobody likes me, nobody told you that doesn't mean it's true just because it came from your right. own head, right? What are we supposed to do with that other than well, I came up with that, that must be true, right? Otherwise, why would I think it? And so starting to deconstruct what were those, and then once you've thought them, you know, our brain starts seeking evidence from our life. See, you aren't very good. You, nobody does like we you. We start confirming You were it. picked last. We start confirming it. So by the time we're adults, we have a lot of evidence to confirm these beliefs, right? And then we, our life experiences start mirroring it because that's just how the brain is wired. We have to live in congruence to what we believe about ourselves, right? So starting there, it's like a, as simple as it sounds, it's groundbreaking to be like, oh wait, I don't have to believe that. I don't have to take ownership of what other people 
told me, right? Changing that, understanding what were those that started young and why now are they validated by evidence in your life? How do we start to create evidence of the contrary, right? So that's where change is so hard because the brain is a data bank of our past. And so it constantly cross-references the past to make sense of today. But we don't have a data bank of our future, of who we right. want to be, of how we want to feel. So because the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what has happened and what we're actually really vividly creating, imagining, feeling, how do we start to create evidence for the brain to actually have something to validate what is possible? So we start also not just relying on the past to get us to where we want to go, but actually creating and understanding that the way we were designed was to be creators, right? We are such visual beings and they've just, they've shown so many studies, human beings more than any other creature or animal is so visual. Yet what do we spend time visualizing? Worst case scenario. What, what, do we, what do we relive over and over again? The things that happened to us that defined us, right? Our failures, the things that hurt us. So I take that same principle and let's start creating you know, what we do want.